Hi, Adrian. How are you? Hi, Carmen. Good and you? Good. Welcome to ABO. Thank you. I'm happy to have you here. Well, it's we record remotely because you're you live in Sydney. Uh, so, Adrian, you're the founder of Sleek, a business and corporation and accounting services in Hong Kong, Singapore, the UK, and Australia. Founded in 2017, and in 2021, you got a 25 million dollars fundraise. Congrats on that! Um, and with your 460 staff, your co-founder and you are helping more than 16,000 clients with financial management, bookkeeping, CFO services, and business insurance. So last time we chatted. A fun fact about how you started Sleek is that the idea was sparked following a very poor experience with an accountant. We're not going to name them. <laughs> um, it was for a previous business project you were leading in Singapore. So long story short, you built this holding company there and you had paperwork issues that triggered the, the idea to start Sleek. Um, so Of course, you learned from this experience, um, and I guess you've already uh, been through hurdles and and you know issues because you're. We can say you're a serial entrepreneur. It's not your first entrepreneurial project. Um, so has this, but has this experience changed your vision of how to handle unexpectedness and unexpected hurdles and bumps on the road? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if I go back to the uh, really like, you know, um, yeah, like, you know, epiphany moment uh, that uh, I had uh, back then in, in Singapore. Uh, yeah, like I, I was really like, you know, tired of overpaying someone that was completely disregarding my satisfaction as a client. And that was like, yeah, not using technology and taking me through processes that were like, you know, uh, coming straight from the Middle East. Um, so, yeah, that's that was like, you know, the, the first failure I've experienced um, when dealing with a service provider, I mean, at that, mm. at that level. Um, and so, yeah, like, because I, I really wanted to to, yeah, to to see things differently and to experience things differently, um, we've decided to actually bootstrap um, a response to that problem that we were facing. So instead of just being too French and complain on how miserable we were with that, uh, you know, accounting firm, we've decided to actually build the solution. And of course, when uh, two uh, non-Singaporean persons uh, are launching a project in a very local uh, paperwork related uh, vertical, mm -hmm. such as uh, accounting and, uh, and admin in general. Um, yeah, you need to, uh, you know, get ready for um, unexpected, uh, you know, things. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like at the end of the day, I can say it was my only real first, uh, you know, like company. Um, that I've launched. Uh, so serial entrepreneur, yeah, I've launched multiple like small projects, but that was like, you know, the, the, the first, uh, you know, really big one. Um, so yeah, mm. like, you know, not coming from that vertical, we had to really be prepared for the unexpected um, to like, you know, train ourselves on, uh, you know, the overall accounting and, and governance framework uh, of Singapore and now other countries uh, to then be able to operate on this, on, on actually on these verticals. Um, so mm. Yeah, that has completely changed my way of, uh, you know, approaching failure and like, you know, things that were unexpected. Now we have a process. It's mainly around, yeah, uh, yeah like, you know, analyzing the framework and understanding uh, what we can do and what we cannot do, where the gray line is um, to then, uh, you know, like build something that actually, uh, yeah, keeps the client experience delightful, uh, yet, uh, you know, respects the uh, local framework. And Uh, if I look overall at all the markets that we uh, are currently operating, accounting and, uh, you know, governance is a very traditional vertical. So we mm -hmm. are constantly just, you know, asking ourselves, okay, how can we just like um, improve the overall experience? How can we just build something that's more, uh, you know, customer centric rather than to just like reuse the, uh, you know, good old, uh, sorry, bad old <laughs> recipes from the past. Uh, that we're mm. currently fighting, actually. So, so yeah, like, yeah, uh, definitely changed completely my life, actually. Ah, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you, you just said it's like the word traditional. I mean, 
I'm I'm so not good at paperwork. It's really the things I hate to do, and I'm very bad at it. Um, for a business owner, it's not well. It's quite common actually, but it's uh, accounting, bookkeeping, all of this. Well, you have to get it done. It's very useful. You need it, and it's also not very pleasant for some people. Um, so how do you make this attractive, like trendy, like not boring? Because um, I have this image of account an old accountant, uh, like not fun and very serious. It's, this is a stereotype and sorry for the accountants <laughs> listening to us. But um, how do you make it like more modern and more, well, centered around the, cust the customer actually? Well, um, you know, I, I think I'm exactly like you. Uh, on top of that, I've uh, actually repeated twice my, uh, you know, like accounting classes at business school. Um, I've, yeah, like uh, same for like, you know, all the things that were like, you know, business, like legal business related. Mm. Um, so I'm the anti-accountant uh, like person. I hate admin. Like that's to me just a waste of time uh, because that's not time that you can actually dedicate to building your business. So. I think uh, I'm yeah a great guinea pig, uh, you know, for everything mm. we build at Slick, <laughs> because I'm the persona that uh, you know we you know have been keeping in mind from day one to actually satisfy. And what does that yeah. mean actually to satisfy your client as an accountant and a bookkeeper? Um, it's basically to just like yeah uh, minimize the interactions with your clients. So one of the KPIs that we have is actually to minimize the number of touch points that uh, you know our clients have with us uh, throughout the year. Um, I mean, touch points from us to the clients. So it's never good when mm. uh, you know you're you have to like you know ping your client too many times uh, because it means yeah. that you're not asking the right questions or you're not doing your job properly. And there is nothing more annoying as a client, uh, you know, from being poked uh, every every week, every fortnight by uh, by by your partner actually. So. Yeah, like we don't make it, you know, look attractive uh, or less boring because that's the true nature of, uh, you know, accounting. <laughs> we just like streamline the work uh, by using technology to make sure that we have all the necessary data and, uh, you know, answers to our questions uh, by minimizing uh, essentially the touch points with our clients. Uh, mm. At the end of the day, what our clients are paying us for is really like the outcome. What do you get when you pay your accountant, uh, you know, um, X dollars a year? You get free time yeah. off your agenda to, you know, mm -hmm. build your business, be with your family, go, uh, you know, leave your hobbies. Uh, so that's essentially what we're uh, delivering to clients. It's peace of mind, more time for them yeah. and less time, like, you know, pulling their hair, uh, you know, dealing with uh, very <laughs> traditionally minded uh, accountants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... And so we just said earlier that you recently moved to Sydney, where you are now. Um, so I imagine that this is also a work like for you to expand your business and maybe like develop it more in Australia. So I imagine you set goals for your business. Um, but do you also set goals for yourself and for yourself and your career? I mean, is it like, I don't know, earning more money or having more time for, you know, like your family or whatever. Um, and do you feel that you are reaching those objectives or maybe you've reached them already? Is it something that motivates you um, and makes you like feel alive? Uh, that, that's a very broad question. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So uh, among the two, like, you know, my co-founder and I, like, uh, you know, he's the CEO based in Singapore. So I'd say that, you know, he's the sedentary guy. Uh, he has not moved mm -hmm. since we started. Yet we've started together in Singapore, but in 2019, I moved to Hong Kong uh, to launch the local ops of uh, Sleek in, in Hong Kong. So after four years there, um, and we had like, you know, a business really ongoing in a pretty good uh, manner. It was quite healthy. Um, the operation started to be quite big. And we saw also like, a, uh, you know, uh, an opportunity for me to come to Australia to share all the mistakes that, uh, you know, I had made in Singapore, in Hong Kong to, mm. you know, get um, yeah the operations of the ground actually quickly, quicker. Um, and we found someone smarter than I uh, like to take over uh, the Hong Kong operations. And he's doing an amazing job. And now I'm actually here in Sydney uh, going again from zero to one, um, you know, from no clients to uh, having a thriving business. 
So I'd say it's, yeah, like um, I've got long-term goals. Uh, obviously, we have a business plan. Uh, we have a budget uh, that we iterate, uh, you know, on mm. uh, like quite a few times throughout the year. So we have a North Star on how to grow our business uh, and, yeah, the number of clients that, you know, we need to hit. But I don't think, you know, it's really an Excel spreadsheet that, uh, you know, drives my life. Uh, I like mm. to think that right now uh, the thing I enjoy the most about Sleek is, like, empowering business owners. Um, and, mm. yeah, like, every day we come across uh, new projects that are, like, all super exciting. And, yeah, the... the what drives me is really my passion for entrepreneurship. I mean, to me, entrepreneurship is not like uh, systematically, like, you know, raising millions of dollars and building a blockchain for pet food, for instance. It can be just like having a sandwich joint uh, and just like, you know, uh, launching that because that's what drives you and that's your passion, actually. Um, so the minute you have your own business um, and you have, you're living from this, I'm like overexcited for you. And I'll be asking you a ton of questions, actually. So I guess yeah. that, yeah, that, that, that's now like really my passion of, uh, uh, you know, building mm. Sleek. Um, and then on a more personal level, yeah, like I've got like, you know, goals in life, uh, achievements that I want to do, like uh, for others, for myself. Um, I guess, you know, we all have like some kind of a to-do list uh, or mm. like a bucket list. Sorry, I was looking for the, for the like perfect <laughs> word. Um, then what's the system that we put together? So... On that, I must say that, uh, yeah, um, my, my, my wife would say that I'm extremely messy uh, when it comes to like <laughs> everything in my life because I've got this like artistic blur where I know where everything is, but I know where I'm going. It's but organized for mess. Exactly. It's organized it's, mess. Yeah. It's artistic chaos. Uh, <laughs> I know where things are. I know where I'm going. Uh, it's just that, uh, yeah, sometimes it tends to be, uh, you know, a bit difficult to communicate about mm. this, but it, it, it's all good. So... I've got a system in place uh, and I've actually surrendered on trying to change myself and the way I am because it's yeah. too late. I'm an old prick. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I've certainly like improved uh, over time in actually like uh, yeah, managing my day to day, having a system in place to actually be super efficient uh, and actually mm. getting things done. What's the next thing on your bucket list? Like personal? Uh, that's a... Uh... That's a good one. Um, I, I guess like we are here in Australia. Uh, <clears throat> the country is amazing. It's bigger than Hong Kong. Uh, and after four years of COVID in Hong Kong, I couldn't be happier to have a car and then just like drive for the weekend. So I think right now, yeah, we have a, a big bucket list of 18 months of travels uh, around Australia. Wow. Um, so Ooh. I guess that, yeah, that, that's like the, 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 the shorter one, the shorter term one, actually. Mm, cool, cool. Um, and well, still related, but I love to ask deep questions. <laughs> so I know it <laughs> can be a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, as an entrepreneur, we know that the, the, li the, the line between personal, professional is blurry and this is okay. I mean, it's not a problem because it's so diff it's such a different life. So have like personal experiences Uh, ever influenced your business philosophy? Because usually we only talk about business and like, oh, this happened in what we said earlier, like the, the story about uh, the bad accounting service that you experienced in your previous project. Then it led to, to, to start Sleek. But does your personal life also influence your business? Uh, yeah, because uh, I think like, you know, who you are is uh, just, um, you know, uh, com like yeah, a consolidation of like all the experiences that you, you had in the past. I think, you know, like on the entrepreneurial like side of, uh, of, uh, of my artistic chaos, I would say, like there are two things. First one would be uh, the fact that um, since I'm born, I've never lived more than, yeah, three, three years, four years at like the same place. My... Um, I mean, because of the work of my dad, we were just like moving places in France. We also lived uh, uh, for many years in South America. And every three, four years, it was like, you know, I was being dragged, you know, from one city to mm. another with my siblings. Um, was it start, difficult? It's actually, yeah, at the start, it's actually quite difficult. You're like, why? Like, I've got my friends here. I've got like, mm. you know, my life and so on that's comfortable. 
But yeah, the start, uh, yeah, I won't deny that it was actually a bit painful, but um, I guess that, yeah, I've learned a new language. Uh, I've discovered new cultures. Uh, we've traveled so much. So that was like extremely enriching. Uh, and it somehow became a virus to just like uh, move every three to mm. four years. Uh, and also like, you know, be extremely curious about the environment uh, I live in and, you know, meeting people. So mm. on that, I just like, you know, fulfill my curiosity by like that was triggered by, I think, all these experiences by meeting new people, entrepreneurs that have like, you know, projects coming from all, all, all paths of life. Um, so that's that's the, I think, the, yeah, the, the experience that, you know, drove that Mm. Yeah, very deep curiosity I have in, in everything. And, and then the second one um, that yeah, showed me that like, yeah, I could actually build things and that driving change was actually exciting was at business school. I was uh, the um, yeah, leader of um, the, um, what you would call the student union. So mm -hmm. it's a very admin name, but we were just organizing parties and uh, like yeah, weekends <laughs> away with like the whole, uh, you know, uh, the whole school, uh, but at an industrial level. I mean, we, were, we had like weekends mm -hmm. with 1,200 people, uh, oh. lots of parties, lots of excess, uh, but everything <laughs> was organized. So I was leading 30 people back then. We had yeah, 350,000 euros of budget for the year. Uh, and that showed me that, yeah, it could be fun, but that you could also like, you know, be building things and uh, driving exciting projects and that there were no boundaries or like, I mean, no limits to your creativity as long as you had, mm. a, you know, a, a working PNL and so on. So that was really, I think, the founding moment where I was like, okay, I really want to be independent and to be able to, yeah, to drive uh, my own my own stuff. Um, and yeah, mm. I think that was yeah, the epiphany moment. Although, yeah, it's not. I was not selling lemonade. I was just like, yeah, organizing <laughs> parties for <laughs> for a lot of people. But that's pretty cool. And are you planning on staying in Australia for how how long? When when did you move in to Sydney? So we effectively moved in in uh, July last year. Uh, but before I was like spending yeah uh, most of my time here already. But like yeah being back and forth in between Singapore, mm. Hong Kong, and Sydney. Um, as I was waiting for for my visa, and it takes a while to get uh, your yeah, visa yeah, to yeah, yeah. So are you planning on staying more than three four years? Or do you think you will get again the virus like come kicking in and <laughs> I guess the, the, the odds are, are against uh, like you know me staying here but uh yeah never say never. Um I, I guess like yeah, three, four years would be a good stint and then like yeah the the, the world is big. Uh, there are plenty of other countries, other opportunities. So um yeah, mm. I, I don't think I envision staying here or even like, you know, anywhere actually for you know, the rest of yeah, my days. Yeah. Uh, it's a really nice country. There are plenty of things to be done. It's really different from Asia where I had spent the last 13 years. Um, but uh, I don't think I will I will spend my life here. The, the world is too big and there are too many things to discover yeah. to, 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 to just stay in one place. At least that's my approach. Mm. But actually, like with such a life living in many different countries, where is home to you? And maybe home is not a country. Maybe it's just where you are. I don't know. If I say yeah. home, what do you think about? So that, 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 that's a good question. Uh, I've got, uh, <laughs> this is a therapy. Like a... This is not a podcast. <laughs> let, let, let me lie down. Okay. No, I think that we, so we, have, we have a what I would call like a family headquarter in, uh, in Lyon in France. Um, okay. And yeah, at some point, my parents were living in China, my brother in Chile, uh, my sister is in France. So we were all gathering at the mm. same time there. Um, now I've got more uh, more family members that are in France. So I'd say that it's definitely there. Um, but yeah, it's I mean, I, I've never had like, you know, what others would call like, yeah, uh, you know, friends for life. Uh, mm. I know a lot of people I've got like good friends, but it's not like, oh, I've got my best friend. Because I was in kindergarten yeah, yeah. with him and I've said like, you know, my whole life. No, I've got plenty of friends and like, you know, they're all from various bubbles that, that I had like, at, you know, different steps. Mm. And I enjoy like, you know, meeting them again. Mm, cool, cool. Um, and so we talked about unexpectedness and hurdles and all sorts of issues facing as an entrepreneur. But what about, because you have a co-founder, 
So what about conflict? Do you handle, how do you handle conflict? And I'm asking this because this is a very important topic as an entrepreneur. And I, and I don't think people talk about it enough, uh, especially when you have partners or you, you work with clients. This is some people fear conflict, but I guess, well, to me, since now that I have, like, since I started my business, I just analyzed this as, I need to be comfortable handling conflict. I need to be not scared about it, um, especially for people that are people pleaser. This is maybe more difficult. Um, so do you have examples of, of conflict you had either with business partners or clients? And how did you handle it? Yeah, I mean, uh, first let's start with with, with the clients. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. like you know, uh, I gave you the marketing pitch. Obviously, we you know like uh, we like we do most things very well, but we've had mm -hmm. also like our fair share of mistakes and like you know major issues delivering the service to clients. Um, sometimes yeah. it's our fault. Sometimes it's actually like the, the clients not really understanding how we work and leading to confusion. Um, so yeah, and now <laughs> I would say that the only interactions I have got with clients is when they escalate things on LinkedIn or like, you know, they call mm. me straight on my mobile and so on. So I'm very <laughs> comfortable on that. Um, and yeah, like, you know, I'm here to actually get things solved, uh, for them. Um, so yeah, like obviously I want to do good. Most mm. of the clients actually are also good people. So it's like, you know, we're adults. We're here to actually find a compromise and, or, I mean, to find sorry, like a solution for one. Um, and yeah, like, you know, if there is one thing that uh, we do well at Flick, it's that, you know, from day one in 2017, when we launched, we have been like client obsessed, actually. I mean, client satisfaction mm. obsessed. What does this mean? It means that actually, like, I'm ready to take a hit, to take a hit to just like, you know, build a stronger and longer term relationship with my clients because I believe yeah. on the long, the long game. Actually, I'm not here to like, you mm. know, just uh, do a one-off, give you a service for one month and so on. No, no. Like most clients actually with us stay for a number of years. Um, so I'm really here for the long game. I'm committed to plan satisfaction, but <laughs> not at any price, obviously. So <laughs> at some point you need to be able to say no. Uh, and mm -hmm. saying no actually is a very powerful thing because it just like outlines precisely what you're able to do and the things that you're not able to do actually. So you've got to be very comfortable in actually doing so. At the very start of Sleek, I was not very comfortable in doing so, uh, but just, yeah, like, you know, being boxed by clients and, 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 and so on actually made me, you know, realize that, yes, now we've got a method on how to like handle, mm. uh, you know, sensitive But when uh, do you, you know, say no? When do you say no to uh, a client? Or, or just well, stop I mean, the... We, we like to say that uh, we're, we're, we're not a Ferrari in terms of service. Uh, we're a good Toyota. So we will you know, be with you for a number of years. But no, it's, we're not the fanciest car. We don't have like, you know, the, the lavish red color everywhere. Mm. And it's not like, you know, you cannot customize your, your Toyota the way you want. Mm -hmm. actually. You've got a catalog. So when some people are actually like asking for too much customization, no, like, you know, we clearly say no. So... When okay. it's like, you know, my team, um, you know, saying no, sometimes it doesn't work. And they're like, yeah, I want to talk to the manager. So, yeah, I'm here for that to actually like, you know, remind you <laughs> what the, the yeah, framework yeah. is, how we operate and, and, and what we can do and what we cannot do. So, mm -hmm. yeah, like sometimes it takes a bit of time. It takes a few calls. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, yeah, it, it's all about managing expectations. Um, and now, like on the co-founder, um, so I'm very happy, uh, you know, with Julian because uh, we've we have not started the business as friends. I think mm -hmm. we were what you know you would say in English uh, acquaintances. So yeah. just we were just two people. We met at a at a networking and uh, somehow we started to actually discuss a lot of few ideas and we started working on on something. But um, at at any point in time, uh, at no point in time, sorry, we. We had like, you know, personal commitments or like, you know, just our personal lives, like being really like mixed up. And also mm. because I left, uh, you know, Singapore after two years. So I think it's very important to be able to tell to your co-founder uh, or for your co-founder to tell you uh, on Monday morning at 8 a.m. Hey, you sucked at this. You did <laughs> so wrong, you know, at that without mm. compromising the barbecue the next weekend or your holidays with the, you know, the families and so on. Obviously, when there is, uh, you know, um, 
yeah, ethos actually in the relationship with your co-founder. You have a, a second agenda and it's like so unhealthy. Um, mm. I mean, if you're not able to, you know, manage that thing out or like, you know, do, yeah. the, do the difference that it will definitely like, you know, come and pollute your ability to make the right decision or to just, yeah, communicate normally or the way you should be communicating to your co-founder. Um, mm. At the end of the day, uh, we have seen many, many companies uh, that used our service to register a business then fail uh, because the two founders, or like sometimes they were a couple, were not getting along together. Mm. They were unable to yeah. communicate. Yeah. They were unable to, you know, like address uh, the tough discussions and the hard yeah. things. Uh, and to me, it's the number one failure for a business with more than, you know, like one, one actually like, yeah. uh, you know, founder. Um, and at the end of the day, it's like marriage. You, you have yeah. like a wedding, uh, you know, uh, like a prenup agreement, your shareholder <laughs> agreements, uh, and the shareholder agreement has to state what, you know, how the company runs, uh, in good times, but also like, you know, in times of blockage, bad times, mm. you need to be able to get out or to like, you know, make a decision. It's never healthy to be blocked each side yeah. like you know not yeah. moving so yeah like you need to prepare for the for the worst mm. um so yeah like you know yeah. uh, wish for the best prepare for the worst yeah i was about to to do the to draw the same uh um comparison with marriage it's kind of similar but that was there a time for example you you disagreed with your co-founder and and like you, you were absolutely not aligned on the decision for Sleek or whatever. And, and how did you, and, and then what happened? Yeah. I mean, like look, plenty of times, like, uh, I guess, you know, we speak on a, on a, you know, almost on a daily basis. So obviously mm. in seven years, uh, we're like an old couple. So like, you know, we, we communicate a lot. Uh, we tend to disagree on a lot of things, but at the end of the day, like, you know, what you need to ask yourself is okay, what's good for the company? Um, mm. so yeah, like at the end of the day, like it's really the business imperative or like the growth that will actually, you know, like uh, prevail as the main objective. Um, and you know, sometimes yeah, fine, you know, we, we make a decision whether it's one side or the other that actually, you know, uh, mm. made the call at the end of the day, everything we do is actually illustrated by data. So yeah, then you're yeah, able yeah. to know whether it works or it fails. Um, it's, uh, and again, at the end of the day, it's not about ego and like, ah, oh, see, I was right. Your experiment actually failed. No, it's more around like, again, like we're here working together towards the goal, building a business, helping others. Mm -hmm. um, so at the end of the day, like, yeah, we want the best for the company at any point in time. Yeah. And it's not, again, our ego before the business. And I think we've been pretty good at this, uh, not putting okay. ourselves before, uh, you know, the, yeah, the group mm -hmm. interest, like, you know, the, the team actually. Mm -hmm. And regarding the future of Sleek, uh, what do you envision? I, I, I imagine you have a like a business plan, um, but you got a fundraise a few years ago. Are you going to work on another funding maybe, or, or what are your plans to scale the the business? So yeah, like we've delivered the plan uh, on that we actually sold to the you know the funds that we raised from in twenty twenty one. Um, like we're having that discussion in October, 2024. Um, so yeah, we should like be group profitable, a uh, profitable at a group level, sorry, by the end of the year. Um, mm -hmm. and then after we'll be, yeah, uh, a profitable company, uh, with four markets of operations. So yeah, there are tons of uh, ways of, again, like, you know, financing ourselves to actually go faster, grow bigger, uh, and like, yeah, find new markets or launch new businesses. Um, I, I think like, you know, the implementation of technology in, in our day to day is going to like grow tremendously over the next couple of months. Uh, we have been working for a couple of years on implementing what today everybody calls Gen AI before it was machine learning. Um, so yeah, like the automation of most boring tasks of mm. like, the accounting like work will actually be a reality very soon. Uh, and yeah, we've been working on this for a number of years now. So I'm, I'm beyond excited to actually see that live. And then I look forward to also seeing the impact on yeah, the way small businesses actually, you know, get insights, uh, you know, from their day-to-day -day, uh, operations, mm -hmm. actually. So that's going to be changing dramatically the way you can look at your business performance and then make the right decisions to actually grow your business. Um, so, so yeah, look, that's 
to me, that's really like, you know, the, the holy grail that we'll be soon, you know, achieving. Uh, and then after, yeah, it's obviously I've got a, a young and upcoming market here uh, in Australia. Mm. Uh, so it's mainly like, yeah, focusing on that and making sure that, uh, yeah, we grow in a, in a very healthy manner. And, and also that I've got a great team around me and that everyone is, uh, yeah, is fired up by, by what we're doing, actually. Cool. And well, I was about to ask you, but you kind of already answered that question. But what team are you? Are you more going with the flow team or having a clear development plan with like defined milestones and everything? Of course, the truth is somehow in the middle. It's not like black or white. But if you, what team would be, are you, do you tend to be closer to? And then, then the next question is like, are you working on being more, like if you are the going with the flow team, then are you working on getting, being maybe a bit more organized and if all the other way around? I think it was, I, I used to be the going, going with the flow, but I, I saw that if you really wanted to level up your game, you, you, you had to discipline yourself. Um, and mm. yeah, so I did not come to that realization myself. I had read this and I was like, oh yeah, it makes sense. No, like a few years ago, I, I took a, you know, a coach uh, to take a step back and to have like someone slap me in the face, you know, with, uh, you know, a few things, uh, you know, telling me, no, Adrian, if you actually want to change or if you want to like get to the next level, you need to actually like change slightly the, the way you mm. are approaching, like, you know, this or that problem. Yeah. So I, I'd say that, yeah, before I was a very, um, yeah, going with the flow, making decisions based on, on my gut feeling um, mm. more than anything else. Uh, but I've actually, like, changed quite a lot because you can't be a good leader and just be, like, you know, uh, looking at the wind, uh, you know, uh, checking mm. and, or making decisions with, with your gut, actually. That, that, that's impossible, actually. Else yeah. you'll be actually playing with the nerves of your team, and that's not really good. Um, so <laughs> I'm actually now, I would say, semi-disciplined, uh, meaning that uh, mm -hmm. I've got a few, I've got a system. So I, I work with to-do lists, and then I block my, my agenda is actually usually blocked in the morning, uh, where I just like slam my, my to-do list. And I've got then some days where I work on bigger picture projects. Um, so... Mm. Things that do require myself to actually spend, uh, you know, more than uh, 30 minutes actually doing uh, do, do, doing one thing. And yeah. these blocks actually work on, on a bigger priority that we usually have at a quarterly level. Um, and then there is a bigger plan, like, you know, at the year level. So right now it's growing mm. in Australia. And then each quarter we're looking at one channel, one initiative uh, that then I need to actually spend more time on. So I've got mm. that system. Um, usually in the morning and the afternoon it's mainly meeting people uh, and then just yeah scrambling on a, a few other things mm. but that's more like going with the flow so I think that yeah in the morning I'm a very organized person in the afternoon I'm a, <laughs> I'm a creative mess uh, with, yeah. but <laughs> never forgetting the big picture and always like you know striving for like you know striving for that actually yeah actually it's balanced but well from things you said about this and and also earlier in in the episode it seems that and i also found that entrepreneurship is more like a, an introspection and you it, it it's like self discovery and you got to not have too much ego to handle for example business partners but also you took this coach it's 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 about humility please slap me in the in the face and tell me what things I'm doing wrong. Um, and I think this is much needed when you own a business. Otherwise you just turn into this prick always driven by their ego. Exactly. Then for the coaching, I think, you know, he would really slap me if, uh, if he heard that. But <laughs> I think it's more like, you know, your coach making you realize that, yeah, you need to mm. change if you actually want to achieve, you know, something that you wish actually. Yeah. So, so, because if it's like an external factor influencing you, that's not really going to work. So, whereas if it's you, like, you know, realizing by yourself, okay, like now it's time to change, time to level up, time to grow, um, then mm. it's actually more effective. Yeah, yeah. And, well, last question already. Um, as an entrepreneur, is there any lessons that you learned and you would like to share with fellow entrepreneurs or maybe future ones because the people listening to us 
either own their business or maybe they're thinking about it, but still might be still scared to, to take the leap? Uh, I think it's all about really being persistent um, because it's, you get more doors slammed at your face than actually, uh, you know, uh, opened ones. So it may seem easy because we're polluted or brainwashed by, you know, all of these stories with uh, people raising billions of dollars mm. uh, and just like, you know, selling it and, uh, you know, being zillion rich. Uh, no, it's, I mean, before that, yeah, it's good for them. They have plenty of cash. That's good. But before that, you know, they, they were actually like suffering and, and it was really painful. But yes, so that's the part that you, you don't, you, you cannot like, you know, forget or mm. you cannot not go through it. But then uh, I think my main, uh, you know, recommendation uh, is definitely put your ego aside uh, because it's like so unhealthy to think that, you know, the business first runs because of you. That's wrong. You're replaceable. And second, mm. your ego on the way will actually just block your, your growth, both personally and also like, you know, as a business. So just put your ego aside. No one will remember your name in like, you know, after you're dead anyway. So yeah. just do that and you'll see that uh, first you're less impacted by things, uh, you know, when you do such a thing and you sleep better at night. Uh, and second, uh, yeah, like it, it will just make your life much, much, much better. And mm. everyone will actually be probably a bit nicer with you. Mm. Well, great conclusion. I, I hope, guys, that you, you're listening. Please remember this. Um, thank you so much, Adrian for Thank sharing you your me. yeah your deep like it was deep questions a deep conversation but i think it was very insightful and inspiring thank you so much thank you carmen